Happy Sabbath, my brothers and sisters. I want one more time to welcome all of you who were here last night and during the Sabbath school, but also want to welcome all of you who have just joined our study of the book of Revelation. I also want to welcome all of you who are watching um, these things that are happening here online through internet. Wherever you are, what place you live, Whoever you are and whatever you plan to do in your future, I want to welcome you. We are all the members of one and the same family of God. By the way, this is the best presentation what we are doing here ever, ever done by any church here. This is really what the book, you know, when people say we'll study book of Revelation, you know, the pictures here, we see that. That you cannot sleep for a few nights after those, watching those, those pictures. This is really what the book of Revelation is all, is all about. And I want to express my great gratitude to this group. I even I'm, I'm asking myself, what am I doing now here? Everything what we are supposed to know about the book of Revelation was really summarized in this song. According to the book of Revelation, at the time of the end, there will be only two groups of the people. And the book of Revelation specifies both, both groups. There will be the followers of the beast and the followers of the lamb. Those who follow the beast will have the characteristics of the beast. And those who follow the lamb will be Christ-like character will demonstrate in their lives. That's all what the book of Revelation is all about. And the purpose of the book is to prepare us for that, for that future. I just want to say a few words about me. I was born after the Second World War. My country, Yugoslavia, was devastated by Second World War. I don't know, the country probably did not have at that time more than 10 million population. In four years of the Second World War, 1,400,000 people were killed in four years. I still remember as a kid, I was born a few years after the Second World War. In my neighborhood, how many houses they still had the holes of the bullets from the, from the war. My mother, Roman Catholic, and my father, Eastern Orthodox. They lived at the time when communists took the power. And our communism was simply to make jokes, but at the time was very tough. And somehow they found themselves, they got married. My father had a very tough childhood, so also my mother. And my father did not need any religion. They got married. And it was just the, the divine providence. They found the Bible and one lady in the tiny place where they lived who was getting Bible studies from Seventh-day Adventists coming from afar. And finally, they started reading the Bible. They discovered all the biblical truth. So at the age of one, when I was one year old, they became Seventh-day Adventists. We were the only Seventh-day Adventist family in the whole area, living in a communist system. If you were religious, you were a primitive person. You did not deserve to live in the society. But if you are religious, it means you are Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox or Muslim. But Seventh-day Adventists, you don't eat pork, you don't drink alcohol. Keep in mind, juice is for women, for men is alcohol. That's the mentality of the, of the people that, that they live with. 
And now you're seven Adventists. You're the scam of the society. Everybody was against us. And the problem was, we are Christians. We even didn't go to any church. All the church that I knew, up to the age, I think about nine or ten, was our kitchen. When the pastor came, and few church members from a far away, when I saying far away, it can be 30, 40 miles. It was riding on a bike. And that car, I even didn't know in my place after the Second World War what it meant to have a car. So 15 people there in our kitchen, that was the camp meeting, huge camp meeting that I remember. Everybody was against us, everybody. Finally, I finished elementary school. I will tell you some story during my preaching. I started going to the secondary school. I was always a good student. You know, when you have kids, you give them money. They try to see how they will spend money for some candies, etc. I always looked for a good book to buy, even at the age seven, eight, nine. It has to be in your blood. I'm so, I don't know about that. I started going to the secondary school. After three months, the dean of the school invited me to his office. And he said, I don't know how to say it to you. I don't know how to say it to you. You are the best student that we have, but you cannot come to the school any longer. He said, why not? Just count in three months how many absences you had for not coming to the school on Saturday. I remember I left the school bitter. I look at my friends, I said, they're stupid, like a rock. They don't like even school. They will become somebody and something. I will be nobody and nothing. There is no chance for me. I remember I came home. For me, it was a tragedy. And the members of our huge family were coming to my parents, telling them, do you see what you did of your son? He'll be nobody and nothing. Neighbors were coming. The relationship, the attitude toward my parents was not great, but after that, even it became even worse. I just want to tell you is all the friends that I knew during my childhood, they were non-Adventists, drinking, smoking, using all that stuff. And finally, I will be nobody and nothing. Just to make long story short, after the civil war that we had in our country during the 1990s, Terrible story. You even don't know really what happened there. I went to the town where I grew up. Oh boy, I couldn't recognize my town, what happened during the Civil War. But I found many of my neighbors. So what's very interesting is many of my friends were not alive. Those who were alive, heavy drinkers, lost any sense of life. Can you hear me now? My younger brother, who has PhD in the Old Testament, teaching in Florida Hospital, and myself, we are the only people of the old area that had PhD degrees. Nobody and nothing. And I'm standing now in front of you. And to tell you, do you see what I achieved? What did I achieve? If there was no gospel message, who would I be today? My mother, she had seven sisters and one brother. She did not have an easy life. She had sisters. Her brother's sisters are gone long, long ago. Last year in May, we seven brothers, sisters, for the first time after more than 40 years, were able to be all together. We, were in, we live in five different countries. Why we were there in Croatia, to celebrate 100th birthday of our mother. <laughs> we see that she is always losing fight for, for her life. She is almost 101 now, now. She had terrible life. She's the only one alive of her brothers and sisters. I said, Mom, this is what the gospel did for you. Without Christ, who would be you and me today?
We always sometimes talk about how much we sacrifice for the church, how much we sacrifice for Christ. What do we sacrifice? There is only one sacrifice, and that sacrifice was done on the cross of Calvary, and we all benefit from that sacrifice. When you think that you sacrifice for God, you are sacrificing nothing. We are only gaining by believing in Jesus Christ. I just want to testify this to you. And that's why what God did for us in the past Give us the hope for the future. And I would like now to take time to talk a little bit about that future. So I hope that you are ready at this moment. If you open your Bibles, by the way, I will have most of those Bible verses. I will have there on the screen. So please, if you can join me. I was told I can have my presentation until 5 p.m., so I have plenty of time. I didn't say you said, okay, okay. <laughs> Friends, the book of Revelation consists of three major parts. The first major part are the messages to the seven churches. And then from chapter 4 to chapter 11, Jesus promised to John that he will tell him, he will show him what will take in the future from John's perspective. And the second major part we called the eschatological section of the book of Revelation. Keep in mind, everything what I say here, it's keeping in mind you that you're planning to continue to study the book of Revelation. So I'm trying to provide you with as many informations as possible. So the last 11 chapters of the book of Revelation is called eschatological. It focuses primarily, not exclusively, primarily on the time of the end. Not everything in those 11 chapters is about the time of the end, but the focus, focus of the whole section is on the time of the end. And there is something very interesting. Before, before Jesus showed to John about what will happen at the time of the end, we have the introductory vision that is found in Revelation 12. Friends, it took me significant period of time to really grasp the book of Revelation and to pick up the things what I needed for myself in order to clear that perspective about the time of the end. And I never, I want just to tell you, never happened in hundreds and hundreds of presentations about the time of the end that I made across the globe that I would talk about the time of the end in the book of Revelation that as my first presentation would not be Revelation 12. And I hope by the end of this service, you will understand why and that you will fall with love what is found in chapter 12 as I did. And maybe it will have a far reaching impact on your life as it had to me. Are you ready for this? So please, I'm asking you if you want, open your Bibles, Revelation chapter 12. Let's do it together. So please, my question to you is, I have to, I just want to tell you is, I'm so glad that Jesus will come. When Jesus comes, I know that this stuff will be the first object by me thrown into the lake of fire. <laughs> we will not need it there, come on. Of course, we need it today, we need it today, okay, in, in our lives, okay. Every time when we read one chapter of the Bible, if we want to understand the meaning of the chapter, where do we start? You know that very well. You begin with verse 1. But I want to assure you at this moment that chapter 12 is an exception. You don't begin with chapter 1. You begin with chapter 17. Uh, sorry. You don't begin with verse 1, sorry, sorry. You begin with verse 17. Let's read this verse. We are so much familiar with this, with this verse. So the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went off to make war with the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God, and they hold to the testimony of Jesus. And you know that this text is very dear to us, Seventh-day Adventists. We believe that this text 
portrays and points to the identity and the mission of God's end time people. And we want hardly to be a part of those people that God has chosen to proclaim those end time messages that Jesus wants to send to human beings before the time of the end. Let me just explain to you about one special literary feature of the book of Revelation. There are three, but I want to mention just this one. Every major vision of the book of Revelation, every major vision, is found in one chapter or in two, three chapters, okay? Every that major vision always regularly concludes with a concluding text, like normally what, what happens, and nothing unusual. But in the book of Revelation, the thing is, you see, you have the text, then you have the conclusion. But in the book of Revelation, that concluding text at the same time functions as the introduction to the following text. Does it make sense what I'm trying to say? Scholars are calling the text the springboard text. And my friend, Dr. John Pauline, he really found a good expression that I really like. He says this text functions as a dual directionality. It goes two different ways. You see, it looks back, concludes the section, but at the same way, this text is telling us what we are supposed to find in the following section. Can we go to the next slide? Do you see that? How does this verse begin? So the dragon was enraged with the woman. The word so is the translation of the Greek word kai, which really means end. But you know, the word end can have a number of meaning even, even in English. When you say, you see, this, this person is a pastor and instructor. What do you mean? Are you talking about two different people? No. It means that person is pastor who, he, who is at the same way instructor. You see, the word end actually can have different, different meanings. But you see the word so. It's appropriately translated in that way. So or thus. What is the meaning of that word here? May I ask you a question? Can you imagine that Pastor Joseph or Pastor Tanya, they stand here to preach and you are ready to listen to their sermon and they begin. So, what would you say? So what? <laughs> if you use the word so or thus, what is the meaning of that word? In the light, what I just said, so. So it means that something has to be said before that word so. So when you see here the word so, the dragon became enraged at the woman, it means that this text follows what was said before. Are you, are you with me? So now there is a the question. What is that so all about? But we already stated that this text is telling us what we are supposed to find in the following chapters of the book of Revelation. So please, look there in the text. What are we supposed, based on this text, to find in chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19? What are we supposed to find there? I hope that we agree that according to this text, that gives us in a nutshell what we find in the following chapters is that it is about an angry enemy of God's people. He's angry. And he is going to wage the war with the remnant of the women's of spring and we have the characteristics there. So if you really want, in a nutshell, to describe what is found in Revelation 13 to 19, is an angry Satan who is preparing himself for that final war. And the name of that final war in the book of Revelation is the Battle of Armageddon. He has only one chance left. Is the question to be or not to be? That is the question. Why is Satan so angry? 
If you want to ask another question, how much is he angry? Sorry, my brother. You and me, we become friends, huh? And friends can disagree, huh? Can friends be angry at each other? Except spouses, they cannot be, okay? Only friends. So, you and me, we become angry with each other. What do we do? I turn my back and I walk away, and you turn back and you walk away. Huh? But what do you say if I do this? <laughs> would, would, you, would you really believe that I'm very angry? How much is he angry? Okay, okay, good question. How much is he angry? How much is he angry? That he's going to wage the war against the remnant. So now that's the question. Why does Satan become so much angry? Where do we find the answer? In chapter 12. Before we go to study the final events, we have to understand why Satan is angry. But please, one more detail. If this text, Revelation 12, 17, is telling us what we are supposed to find in the following chapter, what does the text is telling us? Do you want me to tell you how certain Adventists are reading this text? In the light with the rest of the book of Revelation. So the Pope became so angry at Seventh-day Adventists. Does he say it like that? Friends, we are not, not denying what will happen at the time of the end and the role of certain institutions. Are you still with me? It's there. But who is the main player and the main actor in the final scene of this world history? Who? It's a Satan. If you were here last night, if you're not last night, I would suggest to you to see it. We established the fact that the book of Revelation describes the concluding phase of the great controversy. And great controversy is not between Christ and Bill Gates, a Christ and the Pope, between Christ and certain institutions, it's between Christ and Satan. Yes, Satan is never coming by himself, personally, to be engaged with human beings. He's using systems. At the time of Daniel, he used Babylon. You remember that. He used then Medo-Persia. Are you still with me? At the time of John, he used Rome. At the time of the end, he will use certain systems and certain institutions, both religious and political. Are you still with me? But Apostle Paul wants to tell us, and he made very clear that God's people must be aware that our fight is not with the blood and flesh. Unfortunately, so many times, even from our pulpits, there is too much focus on blood and flesh. Keep in mind, at the time of Daniel, there was the Pope, and his name was Nebuchadnezzar. Twenty and plus years, God tried to save that Pope, and finally God succeeded in conver converting Nebuchadnezzar. Keep in mind, friends, let's stop talking about people. Even people can be evil, people can be used by Satan, but God still wants to reach those people and to bring them one day in God's kingdom. Our fight, our struggle, is with the arch enemy who at the beginning rebelled against God, started all that mess in the universe, and the book of Revelation is telling us that he will have its end in Revelation chapter 20. I hope that we will keep always that mind, especially in this church, as you are going to study the book of Revelation. Stop talking about people. Yeah, sometimes we have to mention them. Sometimes we have to point to certain systems. But keep in mind, who is the real actor? Who is the real player in the final crisis. The next one. So in order to get the answer to that question, why Satan is so angry, I would like to suggest to you that we divide the book of Revelation into three major scenes. Please, at this moment, we are not going to make the historical applications. This stands. But I want only that we see the way how John the Revelator, inspired by the Holy Spirit, on the basis of what Jesus showed to him at Patmos, how did he describe this arch enemy and his preparation for that final crisis. So three scenes. 
We have here the scene number one. Please, the next one. What does it say? A great... Come on. I had a certain group here during the Sabbath school. Do you remember the Greek word, boy? Now you're Greek experts. Come on, come on, come on. A great semion was seen in heaven. The Greek word semion means a symbolic sign. What Jesus showed to John on Patmos was in symbolic presentations. So what is this great sign? What was all about? The next slide. It talks about a beautiful woman. She was clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. And on her head a crown of 12 stars. And she was pregnant with a child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain to give birth. You are familiar with this text. Beautiful woman. In the Bible, woman is a regular symbol. Should I repeat one more time? A regular symbol for the church, for God's people. In this context, it's God's people of the Old Testament. And chapter 12, we have continuation in the New Testament. She's beautiful. She's closed with the sun. Keep in mind, we explained that the book of Revelation is written in symbol. Sorry, I want always to remind you that. When we want to find the meaning of the symbol, what are we supposed to do? Let's practice it. Go to the Old Testament. And also we did not cover those three other sources. Also New Testament is helpful. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, symbol, light, it's always used for Christ and the gospel. This woman is closed in the gospel. But did you notice it? She is standing on the moon. How much is the moon different from the sun? We know that the sun radiates its own light, but the moon reflects the light of the sun. And you know during the night how moon is visible, and you are glad that you have moonlight. You are glad to that. But in the morning, as soon as the sun appears, what happened to the moon? The moon disappears. If the sun is a symbol for the gospel, what about the moon? That reflects the light of the sun. It evidently is a reference to the Old Testament promises, to sanctuary system, the sacrificial system. According to the book of Hebrews, the sacrificial system did not have a power to save human beings from sun. Simply to point to that better sacrifice that would come. So moon here stands as symbol for all Old Testament promises to save human beings through the and, and the visible presentations of that was the sanctuary and sacrificial system. Keep in mind, I know we live among many, many Protestants, the nice people, but they make one fatal error. They said, we just need New Testament. We don't need the Old Testament. Keep in mind, the church of God is dressed in the gospel, but it is firmly founded. It is standing on the Old Testament promises. The Old Testament gives the promises. The New Testament, the gospel, give us how those promises were fulfilled in and through Jesus Christ. Are you with me? But this woman is a pregnant. She is about to give the birth to the child Messiah. We talked about that last night. The next one. Okay, the next one. Now, as John is watching further, he said, then another Semion appeared in heaven. While the first sign was about what? It's beauty. The second one is about the beast. If some of you want to preach about this text, I'm giving you the title, The Beauty and the Beast. And says, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Please, next slide. This is a symbol that we don't need to struggle. Because in verse 9, John the Revelator explains the meaning of that symbol, and he said, 
that that great dragon, okay, was nobody else but the serpent of old. Please keep in mind, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. So we don't need to struggle with that symbol. Please, next slide. Uh, the text is telling us in verse 4 that the dragon stood before the woman. It appears like woman is there in the hospital and you have there a nurse helping with that birth event. Do you see that? But he is there waiting for a child to be born. For what reason? He says that when gay, the woman gives birth to the child, he must destroy the child. As I told you, everything is because you're going to study further the book of Revelation. If you have a symbolic scene, you want to understand what are you supposed to do. Come on, go to the Old Testament. John is calling Satan here the serpent of old. Please, can you help me? Where in the Old Testament you have the serpent of old? You have the concept of a pregnant woman? Satan who will try, the serpent of old, will try to destroy that child and be victorious. Where do you have it? You remember last night we talked about Genesis 3.15. We see how almost every text of the book of Revelation points to the Garden of Eden and what happened there. What the book of Revelation wants to tell us, that what God promised in Genesis 3.15, now it's about to happen. That child promised long, long ago, a thousand years earlier, is now about to give a birth to the child. That woman, that woman will give the birth. But Satan is ready. Please, can I, can I just ask you that you use imagination. How many times in your life you wanted to achieve something or to get something or to do something, whatever it is? You invest time. You invest your energy. You put all the hope and you even invest all your means that you have just for that particular, because you, you are determined to get it. And finally, a long-awaited moment has come. And you are just about to embrace it. And just in that moment, everything disappeared. And you feel a loser. How did you feel at that moment? Please, I don't have time. In the classroom, I use stories to talk to my students about something that happened to me several times. I was looking for one Bible commentary. I was looking for practically five, six years. And on eBay, I found one. After so many years, looking and striving and saving money, uh, having support of my dear wife, she was always willing to help me with everything what I need for my, for my research. And just there, the last 10 seconds on the eBay, I am still $20 above anybody offer. And my wife came, are you getting it? I said, it seems so. She came, we took each other, and we were dancing in my office. So finally, I sat there on the chair, and I said, let me indulge yourself. You know what you read on eBay? Congratulations. You are the highest winner. I opened the computer, I clicked there at the bottom to hear the dear message and says, sorry, you were outbid in the last moment. Somebody offered two dollars more than me and the whole set of two thousand dollars disappeared in my eyes. After five years, daily searching, etc. I just want to tell you, it was not my wife there. I really would fall down, I would faint down on the floor. How does a person feel, feel in such a moment? Can you imagine about Satan? Thousand and thousand years, with every male child in Israel, pregnant woman, Satan thought maybe this is the one. And finally, he knows that this is the one. And he's there, ready. And the child is born to destroy him, 
The next slide. How long has it been waiting for the child to be born? Just try to think. Next, next slide. What do we read in verse 5? And the Messiah child is finally born. What do you read the next one? Did the serpent of old, did he destroy the child? No. It says, but the child was taken to heaven, to God's throne. Not only that he did not destroy the Messiah child, the child went there to the heavenly places, a reference to Jesus' ascension, and he sat at the right hand of the Father. Next slide. I will not comment to this slide. We ask him question, why is Satan so angry? Or loser? Let's go to scene number two. What do we read there? Next slide, please. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels waged war, and they were not strong enough. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. Next slide. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. I believe that this is well, well known scene to many Christians, including us, Seventh-day Adventists. Please, next slide. What do we read there? There was war in heaven between Christ and Satan. As a result of that war, Satan was cast out from heaven down to this earth. But now we have one problem. Did we decide that we are studying the Bible? We are not studying certain commentators. We are studying only one commentary. Which commentary? It's the Bible. So we want to find from the Bible what is going on here. Please, the next slide. People are divided, Christians are divided about the timing of this event. Some people say this happened at the beginning of the great controversy when Lucifer rebelled against God and he was thrown out from heaven. But some other people, they say, no, it happened at some later point in history. And I would like to invite you that we look in biblical evidences about this. Please, next slide. The problem is that people read only verses 7 to 9. But this is unfinished story. Because the story goes on, and we read in verses 10 to 12 that following Satan's expulsion from heaven, in heaven there was a great celebration. There was the singing that sounded throughout the whole universe. And we have the summary song of that rejoicing there in heaven. And by the way, there are some strange things in that song. The John Revelator recorded that we must take seriously into consideration. What do we read? What is that the heavenly beings were singing following Satan's expulsion from heaven? It says, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. My question to you is, when Lucifer at the beginning rebelled, against God. What kind of singing was in heaven? Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of God has come. And the authority of Christ has been established. Is that song that was that heavenly beings were singing throughout the universe? We see already we have the problem. Can we go to the next slide? They said, the bottom, the, the second paragraph, it said, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. If this is about Lucifer, how could he accuse God's people before God when human beings had not been created yet? 
Please, we have the next one, more serious. The next slide. It said that Satan realized at that moment that he had a short time left. Did Satan realize that he had short time at the beginning when Lucifer rebelled against God? But the last one is more serious. We are reading in verse 13 that when Satan saw that he was cast out from heaven, he started persecuting the woman. Which woman? The woman that previously gave birth to the child. Did you see that? So it means that this casting out of Satan from heaven took place after what event? After the birth of the Messiah. So this is the problem, friends. Now, no, I know that some of you are now confused. What are we talking about? Next slide, please. The evidence strongly suggests that Revelation 12, 7 to 9 took place after Jesus' death on the cross and his ascension to the heavenly places. And Jesus, Jesus made the announcement about that event. He says, now the judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Is that future tense or past tense? Is the future tense? Jesus talks about his glorification following his death on the cross. The next, the next slide. So please, my question to you is, was any war in heaven at the beginning of the great controversy when Lucifer rebelled against God? And the answer is very dogmatic, yes. At the beginning when Lucifer was able to deceive one third of angels there in heaven, when he stood up in an open revolt and rebellion against God, that was a war, probably it was not war with the guns that now in California everybody is talking about. It was not about some weapons. You know that there is so many times war of ideas. There is a verbal war. There was a kind of war there in heaven. As a result of that war, uh, Satan, who got now the name instead of Lucifer, was cast out from heaven at his dwelling place. And you know from our Seventh-day Adventist understanding is, is that when he was cast out from heaven, Satan was going through the universe looking for the place. He was cast out from heaven with regard to his dwelling place. Now he looked for the place where he would live. In the meantime, God created the planet Earth and he created Adam and Eve. Who was supposed to be the ruler over the planet Earth? It was Adam. God gave to Adam all the dominion over everything on Earth. But Satan came, he deceived Adam and Eve. And through that deception, he became the ruler over the planet Earth. By the way, the next slide. Jesus called Satan three times the ruler of this world. And you remember in Luke chapter 4, verses 5 to 6, as Satan was tempting Jesus, you remember, he put him there. On the mountain, you remember, and he told him, look here, the whole world. It was given to me. If you bow down and worship to me, I will give you to this, all this world. What did Jesus say to him? Oh, you liar. You are not the ruler. It was never given to you. I just want to tell you that even the father of lies sometimes says the truth when it is on his behalf. But he was lying here. It was not given to him. He stole it by deception. So that's why Jesus called him three times the ruler of this world. Next slide. After having cast out from heaven, according to the Old Testament, Satan still had the access to heaven. Keep in mind, he was cast out from heaven with reference to his dwelling place. But he still had access to heaven. How? In what way? The book of Job indicates that from time to time, the representatives of different worlds in the universe, they come there before God into the throne room of the heavenly temple, the throne room that we talked about last night. And millions and millions of representatives of different worlds in the universe come before God. Who represented the planet Earth at that time? Satan. He was the ruler. 
You remember the conversation, funny the conversation between him and God in the book of Job. But then Jesus said, I'm going now to the cross. I'll be glorified. And now, now, the ruler of this world will be cast out. So Revelation 12 uh, points to casting out of Satan after the cross. And this time when Satan was cast out from heaven, it was not with regard to his dwelling place. Can we use better English words? He was banned from the access to the heavenly places. The book of Jude, Second Peter, is telling us that this planet Earth, since the cross, it's a prison place for Satan and demonic forces. They cannot leave the planet Earth. They're waiting for their final destination that will happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. The next one. Okay, by the way, I've, I had to skip this. Next one. Next one. By the way, some of you for listening to this, I know, I know, I, as I told you, I read human minds. What did Ellen White say? Is this contrary to what she said? Let's read really what Ellen White said. Do you want to be with me? Let's read it together. She said, the casting down of Satan as accuser of brethren, you see, she refers to Revelation chapter 12, was accomplished by the great work of Christ in giving up his life. Does she make very clear it took place after the cross? Then she said, notwithstanding Satan's persistent opposition, the plan of redemption was being carried out Man was esteemed of sufficient value for Christ to sacrifice his life for him. Satan, knowing that the empire he had usurped would at the end be wrested from him, he determined, next slide, to spare no pains to destroy as many as possible of the creatures whom God has created in his image. He hated man because Christ had manifested for him such forgiving love and pity, and he now prepared to practice upon him every species of deception by which he might be lost. He pursued his course with more energy because of his own hopeless condition. Why Satan is so angry? I believe I couldn't find better commentary on the Revelation 12 than given by our prophetess, Ellen White. She's a loser, she lost everything. How many times, I'm sorry, sometimes I speak to young people and I'm forgetting, I always think that I'm 20. It doesn't settle here. And I talked to students when I was young, when AIDS for the first time appeared in the world. I know how many of you who are my age, I hope I'm not the oldest here, okay? Uh, some of you read, Numerous newspaper reports, the person got AIDS. And that person tried to have as many sexual intercourse. Finally, when the person was caught, what did he say? I'm going down, I want to pull with myself as many people as possible. That's what hatred does. That's when you realize that you're a loser. You're going down, you're pulling people after yourself. That's the condition of Satan. That's why he's so angry. The next slide. Now Satan was finally thrown out from heaven. The next one. Scene number three. Satan knows that he cannot. The next scene, the next slide. Satan knows that he cannot harm Christ any longer. He knows that he is defeated. But he knows that he has only short time left. He knows that his destiny is decided. Next slide. And he knows that here on this earth, there is somebody who is too precious to him. And this is the church, his beloved wife of Christ. It is the one that Jesus is there in the heavenly places, working so intensively on her behalf to prepare the place for her. 
He knows that she is down on this earth when there is a suffering, when there is too much, too much at risk. And this is what Ellen White made. She said, Satan, knowing that the empire he had usurped would at the end be arrested from him, determined to spare no pains to destroy as many as possible of the creatures whom God he created in his image. He hated man because Christ had manifested for him such a, a loving uh, forgiving love and pity, and he now prepared to practice upon him every species of deception, the next slide, by which he might be lost. He pursued his course with more energy because of his own hopeless condition. The next one. And the text is telling us that Satan started persecuting the church. However, the church is protected during 1,260 prophetic days of the Middle, Middle Ages. The next one. At the end of this prophetic period, John saw how out of the mouth of the dragon, symbolic language, there was a flooding water with the purpose to destroy the woman. That's be, that, that she is swept away with the flood. And that suddenly, suddenly, on the world scene appears an earth. There is a territory appear on the scene. Helped the woman. She saved the woman from that flooding waters and provided a safe haven for, 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 God's, for God's people. And the church is saved. I'm Seventh-day Adventist. I don't have any better explanation that following the mid Middle Ages, there is only one territory in the world. The space that they saved the Christian church. Keep in mind, I'm European. If the United States was not discovered, we would not have today the Christian church at all in Europe. I'm European. Would you agree with me? It's, it's Christianity, even today, it's on very, very fragile ground is standing. I believe it's North American continent that was discovered. When pilgrims came here with the goal to establish religion without the Pope and the government without the king. That system is not perfect. Far away, far away that's perfect. But according to the prophecies of the book of Revelation, that territory somehow God used to save the Christian church. Please, as, as you will be going further to study Revelation 13, the message of the book of Revelation, that that friendly earth that saved the Christian church will actually become the final battlefield just a short time before the second coming of Christ. That Christ-like beast, two horns of the lamb, when it begins, start speaking as the dragon. And all those final events will be, will be launched. The next, the next slide. How does Satan feel now? As you know, the next text that we are supposed to read, it's 1217. It says, so, now we understand why the word so. So, the dragon became enraged with a woman. He went off to make war with the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and they hold to the testimony of Jesus. Next slide, please. Why Satan is so angry? There are at least two reasons. Number one, he knows that he's not, not strong against God. He's a constant loser. He has lost his rule over this world. There is no longer place for him in the heavenly places. He does not have access there. And he realizes that he has only a short time left. His days are counted. So why is so much important to understand Revelation chapter 12? Please, next slide. The purpose of Revelation chapter 12 is to warn God's people that they are facing today and they are about to face in the soon future an angry and furious Satan, furious enemy. He's experienced much more than any one of us. He's stronger than any one of us. And any our human effort, which is based 
on our righteous deeds, we are already on the umbrella of losing against that experienced and strong enemy. As Ellen White said, he is now prepared to practice upon God's people every species of deception by which he might be lost. He pursued his course with more energy because of his own hopeless condition. Next slide, please. Paul warns us of the end-time activity of Satan with all power and signs and false wonders and with all deception and wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. The next slide. What is the purpose of chapter 12? My brothers and sisters, I'm now talking to you as pastor, to pastors. We are all pastors sitting here, wherever I go. Talking about the end time, what will happen. The faithful seven Adventists coming to me and to telling me how they learn. God spoke to them in order to be saved for the time of the end. And to go through the time of the end, we have to become sinless. This is the only time how we will defeat Satan. And I go to the Bible, and my, my Bible is telling us, doesn't matter how much I think that I'm sinless, there is always Satan's shriek that I cannot withstand them. How, how strong I feel, and I think that I can really defeat Satan, I forget that he's much stronger than me, he has much more experience than me, and he knows my weak points. He knows where to attack me. Keep in mind, he was attacking Moses for how, long, how many years? 80 years. Attacking on Moses' weak point to lose the temper. And finally he succeeded. Believe me, he can do it with you and me just in a few months. He doesn't need 80 years. Did you notice so many times when we are talking about final events? I'm sorry. When we, when we, when we do this, when we, when we accomplish this, when we, when we, when we reach this, everything is about us. I'm sorry when I'm reading the Bible. It's not about me. When God, something with me. If I am with God, if Jesus Christ is with me, if I'm close in companion with him, then I know that I am on the safe ground. Revelation chapter Chapter 12 telling us there is only one being in the universe who is much stronger than Satan can provide protection to me. And that's Jesus Christ. He defeated him on the cross. He defeated him after his resurrection. He defeated him in the course of history. And he is telling to me, Aranko, you are afraid of the final events. Just keep in mind that Satan for me is a piece of a pie. Can we go to the next slide? It is true that we are facing an angry, experienced enemy. However, the purpose of chapter 12 is to tell us Satan is already a defeated enemy. But Christ is the victorious leader. And that's my only, only hope with him. Some of you already heard some stories from my childhood. And I mention even today, where I grew up. I remember going to the elementary school. I was just a little boy. But I was scared to come to the school on Monday. About 40 kids. We were sitting, and I remember always, the teacher would come. Look there, he said, kids, how are you doing? Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, Aranko, can you come here? Be brave. Why do you behave that way? Would you tell your friends why you were not in the school on Saturday? Can you imagine in front of about 40 nasty kids, you have over and over again to retell the stories, why you were not. Would explain what you were doing there in the church. I telling, and you know the kids, they're just waiting for those stories to make a fun. 
And then the whole scene would conclude, go, you stubborn boy. I don't know if your parents are really smart at all. Go now, sit there. Do you see, kids, we still have superstitious people who still believe in God. I don't know how those people will succeed in contemporary life. I will go there and sometimes those kids were spitting at me, laughing at me. It was very, very hard. You come to the moment that you almost hate going to the school. But I like school. I like, I like knowledge. But that was not the worst thing that I remember. Just imagine that this is the classroom and that this is the entrance door. My place was always here, closest to the door. Every time, and there was a last class session, as soon as the bell announced the end of the class, I will grab my books, even before the teacher, run through the door, run downstairs, run to the street, and probably close to one mile. Maybe, maybe a little bit more than one mile, about two kilometers, I had to run home. As I was running, there are three kids running after me. I just want to tell you is, I knew if they were able to get me, what they will do to me. They will beat me, they will spit on me. They, they were doing all kind of stuff. And I just want to tell you is, I don't know about my speed, how, my, how fast I was running from them. But if somebody was able to measure the time on my running, probably they would send me to the Olympic Games. You can understand how fast you can run when you are in danger. But they were stronger than me. They were three. I was only one. They were after me. My parents were truly Seventh-day Adventists. We were not Seventh-day Adventists. That was our way of life. We are not just Seventh-day Adventists. Everything was about Adventists, that's what we were. I remember my father died away a few, few years ago. I remember the last picture of my father was, he was so feeble, he was, he was dying, but he was able just to lift up. And singing as much as he could, the last song that we're singing, it was a song about the second coming of Christ. That's the parents I, 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 I remember. And they saw me so many times when they came home and they said, Ranko, don't be angry with those kids. You have to give your personal witness to them. But it's very hard to give the witness when you know what will happen to you the next time you are in the school. One day, those kids were able to get me. I came home, I was bleeding. I don't know if some of you probably read the book that my brother wrote about my, my father, that, that story my brother put there, there in the book. I came there. It was at that moment that my father just came back from his work when he saw me. For the first time, I saw the tears in my father's eyes when he saw me. Then he realized what they were doing to me. I was blue. I was, I, they really did very, very hard, hard things to me. And then he said something to my mother. He said, the time has come that I put aside my Adventism just for a few minutes. As a boy, I did not understand what he tried to say. Today, I understand. Few days passed. Those boys did not bother me any longer. The weekend was included. But then one day, I ran out from the school, running home, and I heard steps beside me. I was in panic. I still felt pain on my, on my face. But they were closer and closer. And I saw it's just a matter of moments they were able to reach me. And I know what will happen. And I was running. I was running and suddenly there was a bush. At that moment, a hand was stretched out of the bush and pulled me there into the bush. I looked there, any idea who was in the bush? It was my father. At the, just about the same moment, those boys were very, very close to reach me. Those boys came to the bush. They were looking around. I don't know, probably they thought I ruptured. I don't know, I don't know what happened. They, they, they looked there. 
At that moment, my father came out of the bush. What would you do if you are in, in the place of those kids? What would you do? You would run away. But let me tell you, those kids, they became paralyzed when they saw the face of my father. Finally, my father realized what they, what they were trying, trying to do me. They were paralyzed. That's what they did. They did not know what, what to do. And my father came. He took three hats, like three pumpkins. Keep in mind, he was still Adventist. He didn't want to harm them. But simply, he wanted to prevent what they were doing. He took those hats and threw them down to the ground. You expect that moment they will get up and, and run away. No, they were paralyzed. They did not know what to do. And my father said, touch my boy one more time, and then you will remember me. And they're looking. They don't know what to do. My father said, why are you waiting? What are you waiting for? Run away. At that moment, they realized they were supposed to run away. They got up. They started running away. And can you imagine that little boy, Ranko, started running after them? Just a few moments earlier, I was running to save myself of what can, could happen to them. Now I'm running after them. Please, can you tell me why? How is it suddenly I became so brave? How suddenly I became so much filled with the courage? Why? Because there was somebody who was with me, who was much stronger than those three boys. Believe me, from that day on, they never touch me any longer. My brothers and sisters, if you're thinking about the time of the end, we saw that the portrayal of Satan in the book of Revelation is very, very scary. Very powerful being, very experienced, and you know how to deal which one of us. Our hope is not in us. Forget when we, when we, when we. Keep only in mind when we are with Christ, when Christ is with us. He promised he will never forsake us. He will never leave us alone. You remember the song before the sermon? Where is our hope? Come on. What was the song about? to follow the Lamb. I hope that we will never, never forget. As long as you follow the Lamb, you are on the safe ground. And just the last statement of Ellen White. That's probably one of the best commentaries on the Revelation 12 that I ever found. Look what she said. We talk all together too much about the power of Satan. My brothers and sisters, if you constantly look into the problems in the church, trying to find the mistakes of the people around you, I just want to tell you, you are magnifying the power of Satan. That's what he wants. He wants that you lose your confidence in God, in this church, and what God wants to establish through this movement. She said we talk altogether too much about the power of Satan. It is true that Satan is a powerful being. But I thank God for a mighty Savior who cast the evil one from heaven. We talk about our adversary. We pray about him. We think of him, and he looms up greater and greater in our imagination. Now, why not to talk about Jesus? Why not to think of his power and his love? The next one. Satan is pleased to have us magnify his power. Hold up Jesus. Meditate upon him, and by beholding, you will become changed into his image. Don't forget that the book that we are studying during this weekend, and you will continue to study in weeks and maybe months ahead, is the book about whom? It's not about Satan. He's defeated enemy. It's not about any human institutions. It's about whom? Why don't we follow him? Why don't we meditate about him? Why don't we look at him? And in whom you look, you'll reflect his character. You can belong to only one of the two groups. To follow on that wrong side or to follow Jesus Christ. If you follow him, you know where your end will be. May God bless you abundantly.